1979, Moonraker opened to Boffo Box Office. The James Bond series is answered to the Star Wars phenomenon. The film broke box office records for the franchise, grossing over $200 million worldwide. However, the cost was a staggering $34 million. That's more than twice what The Spy Who Loved Me had cost. Here's a comparison. Star Wars in 1977 cost $10 million. Star Trek The Motion Picture, which was a notoriously pricey flop, cost $30 million. Moonraker cost even more. More? But it was also a huge hit. However, the studio behind the Bond films, United Artists, were in dire straits around the time the next Bond movie, For Your Eyes Only, was slated to begin production. They had pumped boatloads of cash into Michael Cimino's Heaven's Gate, which went on to become the costliest flop in film history. Hemorrhaging cash, they needed to cut down costs. Thus, the film would be scaled back somewhat and brought down to Earth. That meant no more space. To that end, there would be a shakeup behind the scenes. Lewis Gilbert, who made The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, would be replaced by John Glenn, formerly an editor and second unit director for the series. The writing job would go to Richard Maybaum, a Bond series veteran, with Michael G. Wilson, Albert R. Broccoli's stepson, joining on to co-write. Eventually, of course, Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli would go on to shepherd the Bond series through the 21st century. But what about Bond himself? Little known fact, Roger Moore's contract as James Bond was actually up by this point. He seemed ready to move on and even sent up Bond in the Cannonball Run, something which got him into hot water with Eon Films and resulted in a clause where no Bond actor could appear wearing a tux in a movie while under contract as 007. I'm Roger Moore. <laughs> Roger Moore. <laughs> In later years, this would be a tricky thing for Pierce Brosnan to navigate while doing the Thomas Crown Affair. Many actors were considered to take Roger Moore's place. There was Lewis Collins, a British TV star who seemed like a frontrunner but apparently didn't impress Albert R. Broccoli. Ian Ogilvy, who, like Moore, had played the saint, was also considered, but the guy who really came close to nailing the part was Michael Billington, who Eon set up with a publicity shoot and came very close to announcing his bond, but finally, Moore returned to the role at the 11th hour. The fact that the studio had to cut the budget back a little bit actually benefited the series. You see, after the Moonraker debacle, the franchise was in serious need of a reboot. Thankfully, the producers were all too aware of this fact, and the result is really one of the highlights of the Roger Moore era. I've always enjoyed this film. Now, I have to mention that the plot is extremely convoluted. The ATAC, which is a machine that the Russians want to capture, is a big MacGuffin. In the film, the Havelocks find the ATAC submerged, the Russians want it, so do the British. James Bond's after it, but along the way, he runs into Melina Havelock, played by Carol Bouquet, whose parents were murdered by an assassin to get their hands on the ATAC. It kind of meanders, but it's a really well-constructed film. The action scenes are particularly good in this one, boasting some of the best stunt work in the series, and you can really feel that John Glenn's influence as a second unit director and editor is felt here. There's a great scene where Bond has to ski down a bobsled run, that's amazing. Although tragically, one of the stuntmen actually died filming the sequence. The casting is top notch, although the villains are a tad bland. John Glenn would become kind of the maestro of the James Bond series through the 80s. He would film every subsequent installment up until Timothy Dalton's swan song as 007, License to Kill. Special note should also be made of the opening teaser, which is much sillier than anything else in the film, and features the long-awaited demise of Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who is not named due to legal wrangling with Kevin McClory, but more on that in the Never Say Never Again entry. Mr. Bond! Immediately, this undermines the serious tone of the film, but afterwards, the movie becomes pretty down to earth. Although I do really like the bit where Roger Moore, as Bond, visits his late wife Tracy's grave. I always enjoyed it when they would do scenes like this in the James Bond movies because you would get some sense of continuity that he was really playing the same character in each movie, despite the fact that the actors would change. Probably my biggest issue with For Your Eyes Only is the script. It's not bad, but like I said, it's convoluted, and the whole plot with the ATAC is, eh, fine. I give it about a 6 on 10. It's down to earth. It's somewhat slick, but it's really just an excuse for a lot of really good action scenes. But the action scenes are amazing, so I guess that's fine. I quite agree, sir. The thing that really works in this movie is Roger Moore. I think this is probably his best performance as James Bond. By the time the film came out in 1981, Roger Moore was 54, and his age is actually not downplayed in the film. Unlike other installments, here, 
here, James Bond seems less interested in blowing things up and nailing every woman he sees. In fact, he actually turns down sex from Lynn Holly Johnson's character because she's way, 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 way too young for him. Yes, well, you get your clothes on. I'll buy you an ice cream. I kind of like this side of Roger Moore. Rather, he plays the character slightly world weary. It starts off with him visiting Tracy's grave, and you see that there is a cost to his life as a super spy. Throughout the film, he's alternately cold blooded and compassionate. There's a great scene where he cold bloodedly murders the film's big assassin, which is badass, and apparently Roger Moore himself didn't actually want to do it, but really gives you the idea that James Bond could be a cold blooded assassin if needed to be. <laughs> But then there's also a great sequence where he tries to dissuade his leading lady from taking vengeance on the men who killed her parents. And I think this is probably some of the best acting Moore ever contributed to the series. Before setting out on revenge, you first dig two graves. It's really, really good. His performance is awesome. The villains though are a little bit weak. Julian Glover, who would eventually play the villain in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Donovan, didn't I warn you not to trust anybody? Dr. Jones. Anne was actually tipped to play James Bond at one point in the 70s, plays Eris Christados, who is one of the blandest Bond villains ever. His ploy is to sell the ATAC machine to the Russians, and it's kind of boring, but in some ways, I think this might have been intentional. The filmmakers at the time were trying to steer the series away from megalomaniacal villains intent on taking over the world. Christados is just kind of a normal guy. The more interesting character in this is actually James Bond's ally, Columbo, played by Topol from Fiddler on the Roof. And I kind of think in some ways that if they'd wanted the villain to be more explosive, they might have reversed the roles, as Topol has a lot of presence, almost too much to be playing a James Bond ally, while Glover just kind of disappears in the background. Cheers. Yes, sir. I should also mention that one of his henchmen is played by Charles Dance in his screen acting debut. Pretty cool. The Bond villains in this one, mm, a mediocre 6 on 10. As for the Bond girl, I really like Carol Bouquet in this movie as Melina Havelock. She's the toughest Bond girl in the series up to this point, even more so than Triple X. Basically, Havelock is on her own mission of vengeance, killing off all the men responsible for the brutal murder of her parents in the opening scene. Unlike a lot of the other Bond girls though, there's a vulnerability to the character that really sets her apart, and this is one of the few times in the series where it feels like Bond actually really cares about his love interest. Amore, amore. Bouquet, of course, was dubbed for the role because she had a pretty thick French accent, but it's actually her voice on the French version of these films. Interesting side note, there's a part where they're submerged underwater, and Carol Bouquet had a really strange thing about water where she could not be underwater due to some kind of nasal issue. So, they're actually shot on a soundstage with artificial bubbles put in, so they're never actually underwater. I always thought that was kind of neat. Worth noting also is the fact that the film's other Bond girl, Countess Lizzle, is played by the late Cassandra Harris, who was actually married to Pierce Brosnan at the time. And legend has it that Brosnan was spotted by Broccoli while visiting Harris on the set of this film, and that Broccoli made a note of the actor's name for future consideration as James Bond. And well, we all know how that worked out. Another factoid about the Bond girls in this outing. One of the scantily clad extras during the pool scene in the first act was a trans actress named Tula. This became quite the scandal once the film came out, even though Tula is only featured fleetingly in a couple of shots. And I have to say, she's beautiful. The Bond girls in this movie, I would say, get a strong 9 on 10. The Bond music, however, is another issue in this film. Now, it does have a great opening theme song, perhaps one of the best by Sheena Easton, For Your Eyes Only. This is one that often makes my Spotify playlist. And Sheena Easton is so beautiful that Maurice Binder, who would always do these opening credits, was so taken with how she looked, she becomes the only Bond singer to actually perform the song on screen. And in fact, the opening credits for this were released as a music video in 1981. The score itself, though, is not very good. It's by Bill Conti, who was famous at the time for doing the Rocky music, but it's pretty schlocky and one of the few real problems with the movies. It's kind of disco-tinged at time and feels like something off of, you know, a silly 80s action show like the A-Team. It's the only thing about the movie I think that really dates it. The Bond music in this gets a 5 on 10, although I would personally give Sheena Easton's James Bond song, For Your Eyes Only, a strong 10 on 10. It really is one of my favorites of the series. 
The Bond body count in this one is pretty high. He takes out 13 baddies in the film, including one of his most cold-blooded slayings ever when he boots a car over a cliff after the driver kills one of his allies. The number of women Bond sleeps with in this one is actually scaled back quite a bit from Moonraker. He only sleeps with two ladies in this go-round, and you know, I think it was kind of due to the fact that Roger Moore was getting a little bit old. Couldn't just be jumping into the sack with every woman he sees. I kind of like this. There are some great one-liners, however, even if the movie is much more down to earth. There's a really cool part where James Bond has a close call with a shark, and he says, I hope he was dining alone. Q also gets a really good one. You see, James Bond walks into a Greek confessional booth where Q is disguised as a priest. Bond says, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And Q says, That's putting it mildly, 007. There's some good double entendres as well, although he's actually fairly PC. Cheers. Bottoms up. The Bond gadgets are also scaled way back. The Lotus makes a very brief appearance, but it's painted a disgusting shade of copper. Ugh. 1981, how could you? Although, then again, I was born in 81, so I guess the year's fine. James Bond just basically uses that as a car and doesn't blow any helicopters or anything. So the gadgets are laid back, although there's this weird machine that Q uses to make profiles of people that, ugh, it's just so dated. The reception to this movie was pretty good. Despite being a much more earthbound film, For Your Eyes Only was almost as successful as Moonraker at the box office, grossing $195 million worldwide. Although, it must be said, the film actually underperformed in the US where it made $54 million, which is a very solid number, but still $16 million less than Moonraker. But the year, of course, was 1981, and it had some pretty heavy competition from movies like Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman 2, and Stripes. A feast for my eyes. Overall, I'd give this Roger Moore James Bond outing a strong 9 on 10. It really is one of my favorites. Now, 1983 would be one of the craziest years for James Bond ever because it would be the only year we'd ever get two James Bond movies coming out at once. You see, Sean Connery would be returning for Never Say Never Again, so the producers would have to go all out in their next installment, Octopussy. But of course, that's a story for another time. For your eyes only, darling.